Well, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends, welcome to the Plenary Tracker, an online forum following the progress of the Australian Catholic Church's Second Assembly of the Historic Plenary Council. We're bringing you news and insights from the Plenary Council from Concerned Catholics, Canberra Goldman, with the support of the Australian Catholic Coalition for Church Reform and Garrett Publishing. My name is Genevieve Jacobs. I'm speaking to you from the traditional lands of the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people. I acknowledge their enduring ownership of this place, their elders past, present and emerging, and the traditional owners of the places from whence each of you joins us. Our intention this week is to track the second assembly of the Plenary Council with a view to information sharing, critique and advocacy on behalf of the wider Catholic community, especially the church reform movement. So we want to hold the assembly accountable by making its proceedings more transparent. At 7.30 every night, you'll hear from plenary council members, insiders, advisors, observers and others to discuss the day's events as the council votes on issues central to the life of the Australian Catholic Church. And that includes you. The purpose of the tracker is very much to engage with ordinary concerned Catholics as we build a more humble, a more transparent and more inclusive church. So as the conversation unfolds, please use the Q&A function on your screens to send us questions right through the discussion. And in fact, there are a couple of comments that are already in the Q&A. Beth says, last night's plenary session didn't leave me feeling hopeful. Why is it that women, including myself, keep propping up a church that excludes 50% of the congregation that props up the other 50%? And uh, Roger says, do you think that there is some weaponization of the liturgy in the Second Assembly in Sydney? devise of communion practices and seating at the opening mass, different use of St. Mary's Cathedral on the first evening. And uh, from Andrew Fraser, the number one threat to the church is undoubtedly the pedophilia crisis. How can the institutional church be serious about dealing with this issue when it refuses to move on clericalism, governance and married priests? All those and more questions ahead of us. Tonight, our facilitator is Mark Metherill, a founding member of Concerned Catholics, Canberra Goldman, a journalist and communications advisor in health policy. We will get to your questions about halfway through this session. I don't promise we'll reach them all or in the exact form that they're posed, but we will do our best to cover a diverse range of queries. Please keep them courteous and clear. Play the ball, not the person. This is not a space for disparaging others' genuinely held beliefs. Our technical administrator is James McEwen. Please message him through the Q&A if you're experiencing any difficulties. This edition of the Tracker runs for about 45 minutes. So let's begin with the news. The Daily Mass, concluding the first working session of the Assembly, was celebrated in the Ukrainian Catholic Rite by its Bishop in Australia, Nikola Baichok, a timely expression of solidarity by Australian Catholics, complementing the Prime Minister's commitment of support for the war-ravaged country during his visit to Kyiv. Much of the morning was taken up with a contemporary liturgical service and an historical recap of the plenary. Some delegates found that curious for such a time-strapped meeting. Plenary President Archbishop Tim Costello stressed that delegates could only consider the motions before them and that outcomes must, and I quote, be what God desires for the church and not what some groups may passionately push. Despite the bishop's tight control of the event and its agenda, Canberra delegate John Warhurst says there was a real buzz when Zoom friends caught up for the first time. And he was quite taken by the sheer size and the diversity of the 277 delegates assembled. There appeared to be an early setback when the first motion to adopt the wide ranging and prescriptive introduction failed to get the required two thirds consultative vote majority. The bishops of course can override that. It will be interesting to see how the issue is resolved. The motions for reconciliations with First Nations people passed without amendment and called for greater respect and inclusion. There were strengthening amendments for the church's response to the sexual abuse scandal. And this discussion was preceded by a dramatic ritual of lament and repentance, which John Wall has said moved and quietened the assembly. And now to our guests today, as you've heard, the council is underway in earnest. And we'll be considering reconciliation and the sexual abuse crisis in tonight's tracker. We'll be joined by Fra Father Frank Brennan, John Nikoyak and Rachel McLean to talk about reconciliation and Francis Sullivan and Dr. Rose Joyce to explore the child sex abuse scandal and its impact. Uh, let's begin today's events with plenary council members, John Nikoyak and Francis Sullivan. 
Francis Solomon AO is Chair of Catholic Social Services Australia and the Martyr Group of Hospitals. He was CEO of Catholic Church's Truth, Justice and Healing Council. John Lokoyak is Manager of Aboriginal Services at Centrecare in Adelaide, Head of the Aboriginal Catholic Ministry in South Australia, Chair of the National Aboriginal and, uh, sorry, the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Catholic Council. John is a Wadai man from South Australia. He comes from a large Catholic family and has been involved with the church for a very young age. Francis, I just want to start with you. We can't discuss the voting outcomes. We'll get to those tomorrow, but uh, take us through that agenda for today and, and the spirit in which the really serious and profound issues of reconciliation and the sexual abuse crisis were discussed. I agree with uh, John Warhurst. It was a pretty profound experience. Um, I think what it demonstrates is uh, how far the church has traveled in uh, itself over two really fundamental social questions that for a long period of time, the church has been on the wrong side of history. And uh, even though particularly uh, when it came to child sexual abuse, we'll have more to say that, about that in a little while. Uh, there are at least the attempts to put in place uh, proper actions and protocols with regard to the, the first issue about, you know, going down the pathway of reconciliation with our First Nation peoples. Uh, there was no resistance in the room to what was being proposed. There was no conversation and there was no contestability in other words there was a spirit of genuine reconciliation and a spirit of engagement this was a in my mind uh, evidence of a of a church an official church which is frankly getting with the program in um, unqualified ways and i think that was very positive Francis, we're just waiting for, for John to join us. So perhaps we might begin by reflecting on the sexual abuse sure. um, considerations in the council. And as we've just heard, the liturgy of lament for the victims was evidently very powerful. Uh, it included an anointing of ashes at each table, I understand, prayer, song and chant. Uh, take us through the emotion in the room as, as that took place. It was very uh, sensitively or orchestrated the lamentation. We always run the risk, of course, of feeling sorry for ourselves when really lamentation is about, you know, real sorrow for the actions of our church and taking, you know, full responsibility as, as Catholics. And we have to always be careful about that. But it was uh, beautifully paced. There was uh, moments of silence and reflection the, you put the ashes on your own forehead at a time appropriate for you. In other words, it was an expression of where you were at in the process as we went through recognition of the horrors, recognition of the scandal, recognition of the hurt. And it was done in a slowly paced way, which you couldn't help you couldn't help but engage emotionally with. Uh, and it was profoundly uh, moving because in a sense, the room was taking a responsibility. I thought in some ways though, and this is something that is always important, there is the collective responsibility for what's happened. And that collective responsibility is about how we act in the future. But the responsibility for what happened in the concealment can be specifically laid at the feet of those in authority. And sometimes our language loses that focus and that might be intentional or not. And I think, uh, as we've said all along, and even we did last night, you know, language and symbol speak volumes in a church which is about language and symbol. And so I think, generally speaking, it really helped the members come to terms with the motions. Uh, Francis, it does seem that there are a number of bishops and others in the church hierarchy who are quite strongly committed on reconciliation. 
is yes. that your sense that they are really on board with the urgency of engaging? I think what's also happened, and I'll be interested to hear Frank and others speak, but you know, society now seems far more ready to incorporate all that reconciliation requires. And as we hear from First Nations people, they don't have anything to be reconciled about. We're the ones that have to reconcile what's going on. And so around the church, the community is already moving down that pathway. And I think, again, I think some people in the church have had to scramble to catch up. But I can, and that's why I would, to me, it was a no brainer that we would go through with these motions because we need to be in harmony with the community generally. And look, I'm, I'm going to throw to the panel in just a moment, but I did want to ask you we spoke last night about the difference between deliberative binding votes from the bishops and the consultative votes, yes. which can be overridden. What did you make of Archbishop Costello's warning that the results of the council must be what God desires for the church and not what some people may passionately push? I'll just open up by saying I like Tim Costello. I'm very friendly with him. But, you know, it did sound a little bit like the headmaster's lecture. And you know, suck it up if you're disappointed. Um, I I didn't think we needed that. I think we are adults. We're informed Catholics. We're competent people, and frankly, by baptism, we're all equal. So I think we should all be able to work this out during the week, and take responsibility for the decisions we take. And it should be as simple as that. Look, John Lekoyak will be with us in just a moment. We're also joined tonight by Father Frank Brennan and Rachel McLean to speak about reconciliation. Professor Rosie Joyce is with us too on the issue of child sex abuse. A reminder that your questions can go into the Q&A box at any time. Uh, Father Frank Brennan, AO, is a Jesuit priest, Rector of Newman College at the University of Melbourne and Emeritus at the Plenary Council. He chaired the National Human Rights Consultation for the Rudd Government and was a member of the Turnbull Government's expert panel, which conducted the Religious Freedom Review, and also appointed to the Voice Co-Design Senior Advisory Group to help the co-design process to develop options for an Indigenous voice. Rachel McLean says that family has formed who and how she is in the world. Uh, she uh, studied arts law, but her desire to learn about justice was sated before embracing education as her vocation. She currently works in Catholic Education Services Cairns as a leader of formation in the areas of faith formation, religious education, outreach, truth telling, healing and reconciliation. And Professor Rosie Joyce is also with us, a canon lawyer and uh, uh, someone who lectures in canon law at Yarra Theological Union at the University of Divinity. She's a judge on the Marriage Tribunal for Victoria and Tasmania and works as an advisor on canonical issues. She's been the provincial leader of her Brigidine congregation and is a past president of Catholic Religious Australia. Rachel McLean, I'd like to go to you first. I'll begin with you on reconciliation. Now, I know that you've worked extensively in far North Queensland in this area, and you make the point that when we do engage very fully in the reconciliation issue, we not only honor First Nations people, but we learn a great deal if we are not indigenous ourselves. I wanted you to talk to me about what you've seen work powerfully well in the reconciliation space in the church. If indeed, as Francis suggests, we are now at a point where as a community, as a church, we are really willing to take this on. Uh, thanks, Genevieve. I'd first like to start by acknowledging the Gimoy Wallaburra Yudindu people on whose country this is being recorded. Um, it has been a profound privilege to walk with and learn from the First Nations people in far north Queensland. And it's through the First Nations Indigenous research from the Western um, research background, if you like, that has given us the permission to bring people who might not be open to heart to heart or head to heart uh, conversation, that Western Indigenous research has provided us with another way into the reconciliation journey. So I think the way that um, the gift that we've been invited into of walking with, learning from, connecting to the stories of the people of place, um, collaborating with people within and outside of the church, so it's not a, um, a monocultural or um, mono context that we're engaging in has been really profound. And in that way, when we, um, when we are less than one, 
uh, I become stronger in myself. So when I, my experience has been when I see and learn from the traditions, the cultures, the contexts of the people that I walk with in healing, that I walk with in truth telling, I become a better person, a better Catholic um, and a better advocate for truth and reconciliation. And Rachel, I wonder if you could also talk to us from your experience in the areas where you've worked about how First Nations art, dance, spirituality sits comfortably within the church, because again, this can be quite a traditional challenge. Yeah, I don't know if anybody has had the privilege of um, sitting in uh, St Monica's Cathedral in Cairns. Uh, it was reimagined uh, with some glorious creation windows, which tells the story of place. That reimagining um, happened with small dialogue, small consultation with um, traditional owners. The work that's happening now where there is deep, real, authentic engagement with First Nations people, where story is given to us as Catholics, um, just brings a completely new layer. So those glorious windows of St Monica's Cathedral are something to behold. So too are things like um, the fruits of the spirit or the um, come to the water creations that local First Nation artists have, artists have commissioned for local parishes um, in Cairns. And I think it's the joy comes and the depth of, our, um, of those gifts come when that is in co-creation and co-collaboration um, that is authentic and not over the top. Yeah, I, I think this is such a powerful point when so much missionary activity was directed towards suppressing exactly this cultural practice, particularly as it related to religious or spiritual themes, to, to suppressing this intrinsically very, very deep connection with this place. And, and Frank Brennan, I want to go to you. The new government has, of course, put the Uluru Statement from the heart front and centre in Anthony Albanese's speech claiming victory, the very first thing he said. What are the implications for the church, for its practice, and perhaps the outcomes for this council from, from that decisive move on the new government's part? Well, I think it means that uh, we've got the green light for a lot of what was being discussed today. It's just a bit of a pity that John's not online at the moment because I think today was uh, an absolute gold letter day for NAPSI, the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Catholic Council. If you look at the document, 15 footnotes in that section, 12 of those footnotes, direct quotes from NAP6 documentations and representations to the bishops over the years saying, get with the message. Another of the footnotes then from the Uluru State. So 13 footnotes from indigenous groups, one from a Pope and one from a plenary council. Great stuff. Second thing I'd say, oh, and it's good to see John there now. So maybe, maybe I should defer to John now and come back after. How about that? Uh, okay, we, we can do that. John McCoyack, a, a very warm welcome to you. And uh, I, I think I'm hoping very much that you can see and hear us. I'm just going to scroll back and, um, and let people know who you are. Um, Manager of Aboriginal Services at Centre Care in Adelaide, Head of the Aboriginal Catholic Ministry in South Australia and Chair of National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Catholic Council, a what I man from South Australia. Um, John, terrific to have you with us. We're talking about the significance of the Uluru Statement from the heart, the government's decision to put it front and centre, but also I think a real job of work ahead of us as we move towards a referendum on the voice to parliament. So I'm wondering what you see as the church's role here, particularly when the voice was so regrettably, so completely politicised when it was first gifted to the nation as an idea um, from the Uluru gathering. Um, can, you, can you hear me? I've had some technical problems here. Got you beautifully, John. I can see you. I, I can hear you. So go for it. Uh, look, I, I, I'm excited, you know, with my role within the church. And, um, and, and I, I sort of believe that us as Catholics and the work that we've done and we're doing at the moment with the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Catholic Council, um, we're, I'm excited about hoping that we can lead the way and really, I, you know, we've got the statement, um, but what we really need to do is um, put together how we're going to do it and, and assist our people um, in doing that. But I probably more importantly, in order for it to work is to get all Australians to support it. And I'm hoping that's the role that the church 
um, will play in the Uluru Statement. And look, exactly my question, John, this is becoming increasingly powerful in some churches. And we heard just before you came on from Rachel about how absolutely this has been an act of co-creation in, in Northern Queensland where she works. Do you, John, get the sense that everyone understands how important and significant for the church as well as the nation the reconciliation journey is? Yeah, I think so. I think um, with the church and the way things have been going, um, um, I think the, what I'm finding today that more Australians want to know and learn more about Aboriginal culture, and I think if the church embraces it, um, that will get a lot more young people back into the church. Um, but I think the beauty of it all is um, learning about Aboriginal culture and the caring and sharing and how we live in harmony with the land, um, which will in turn help with us in our healing, but also working together with the church, um, I think it will really embrace um, a whole culture of people working together and caring and sharing. Look, I, I want to move on before we go to the questions onto the sexual abuse crisis and the discussions today in the council with Francis Sullivan and with um, Rosie Joyce. Francis, you've noted the significance of the session title, Choosing Repentance, Seeking Healing. Are we up to choosing repentance yet? Have we, have we fully accepted as a church the truth and indeed the ongoing horror of what's been revealed? I think what we uh, as a church are doing is incorporating the incidence of child sexual abuse into our ongoing story. We haven't actually let the scandal confront us to our bones and listened to what that means about the type of culture that we grew, which not only enabled the abuse to happen, the concealment to happen, but to also, in a sense, not readily dispense justice. And it, uh, it took, let's be real, an outside public inquiry to at least bring the church to a degree of transparency. So these are two things. And there are elements within the church that always want to address this issue frankly, like they have other people who are discriminated against. They want to address it in a sort of procedural way by protocols and compliance to safeguarding measures instead of having a hard look at ourselves as a culture and what we do about power and what we do about alienating people who are confronting us. That is the real challenge. And it's not just the sex abuse challenge, it's a challenge of looking at a healthy culture as church. Rosie Joyce, to you on this issue of whether we've fully accepted the truth and taken action, you've called for mandatory supervision of all priests and those employed by the Catholic Church. You've called for mandatory inclusion of women who have deliberative voting rights on all church committees. That is quite a step. Is there anything in council that suggests that those, that those options are being examined, that this is being taken seriously? I think you might still be on mute, Rosie. Sorry. Got you I think <laughs> the first thing I'd like to say is we need to remember that those abused by church personnel carry their burdens for life. Um, we have really ruined their lives. While well, we have rituals of reconciliation, we are never finished with it. And I think that's something we have to take to heart. We need to be walk to these people and listen to them. I question whether we've done very much in the, in the area of addressing the issues which caused the sexual abuse in the first place. An abuse of power and poor governance. From my perspective, I don't see any changes in governance, church, or the very minor ones Pope Francis has introduced. I'd like to see the recommendations from the Royal Commission carried out. Um, I think we've done what I see the diocese doing. 
in demanding police checks, working with children checks, very basic things, but they're not addressing what caused this sexual abuse and how do we change it? <clears throat> because this is the culture that allowed it to happen and foster and grow. I think also for the Catholic community, our responsibility is to um, recognise us all as all the baptised. If you want to talk about a person being ontologically changed, we're all ontologically changed by baptism according to Thomas Aquinas. However, sometimes it's used as a means of privilege and exclusivity and power. And I think that is quite opposed to what the message of Jesus, even the message of ordination is on about. And I'd think... just like to invite you to talk a little more about that meaning of ordination, Rosie, because I think this is a powerful point. <clears throat> Say that we need to recall it's a role of service rather than power. And that does connect with what I know Francis has described about the council's deliberations, that the motions go to procedural issues and not cultural reform, not a deep understanding of what ordination really is and means. Uh, yeah, and to follow on for that, um, when I looked at the I note on the motions and amendments, the motion, the, any amendment had to be consistent with church law and teachings. And I thought, if that is a note we've got, what change do we expect to happen? Mm. What change are we going to allow to happen? Um, I don't think we've started doing that yet as a church. I think what the diocese have been doing is making sure we don't get caught out again mm. with these checks. But I, I can't see governance being changed at all. Well, Francis, you, you've nominated the formation of seminarians, the performance of priests and religious in ministry, a deeper examination of the impact of celibacy, all among matters that need urgent attention. Can or will the council make recommendations on or facilitate those matters? I mean, what Rosie's talking about there in a profound examination of what ordination means and is, that's, a, that's a, an extraordinarily deep consideration. Are we seeing consideration at that level? Uh, well, I think what we've got is a, um, an institutional resistance to the findings of the Royal Commission. Um, there were 16 specific recommendations from the Royal Commission um, aimed at the Catholic Church. And uh, the church hierarchy, including the religious leaders, have not progressed on all of them. And they won't because there was always a view inside the church leadership that the Royal Commission somehow was um, inordinately concentrating on the Catholic Church, didn't understand it as a, as a structure, and therefore its recommendations were always going to be uh, warped. And that's, as I've said all along, goes to the culture of defensiveness, a sort of instinct of self-containment, that can play itself out in arrogancy, which is not what our Pope asks us to be like. So I, I think there's always resistance when it comes to the deeper questions. And um, you'll find though, having said that, some of the religious orders and many of the Catholic organizations in effect do look at their culture, do examine how power is exercised, do look to mutuality between the sexes when it comes to governance, do bring in democratic um, decision-making, do share the roles around so that it's not just male domination. So outside the institutional diocesan-based church, the rest of us are getting with the program. Frank I'll, Frank, I'll ask you a question about this in just a moment, but before I do, Rosie, I just want you to talk to me about clericalism and how you think that goes on impacting the sexual abuse crisis. One of the points you've made is that the involvement of women in the appointment of clergy is a really obvious step, but clericalism bedevils this process, doesn't it? It does, and I think it's, it starts with seminary formation, <clears throat> excuse me, why do we have seminaries? 
I know the Council of Trent insisted on them in the 16th century to reform the church. I don't think they're helpful today where you have the young men living together in a community which they will not do after ordination. Uh, why aren't they in parishes, working in the parishes, like their mates going to university, um, earning their living as their mates outside do, uh, rather than be in a, in, in a special hothouse, which I think is artificial. Their conversation would be, I believe, would be very, quite clerical, and I don't think it's helpful for their future and especially their future ministry. I think the more they are exposed to the community, what happens in the community, that's the formation they should be receiving, that they are one with the community, that ordination is the call to service. And I'll say again, I think the Catholic community, even the parish where I am, what does Father want? Um, we have to promote a different type of church. And I, I think especially women too have to promote a different type of church because I think many women um, don't allow this different type of church to, to develop. Frank Brennan, briefly before we get to the questions, I must throw that back to you as the, the priest on the panel. Do you think the church is still primarily concerned with its image and reputation around its management of the sexual abuse crisis? Are we still in the dark? Uh, I think there are some parts of the church which are, but uh, I do think there's been progress and, you know, in large measure because of the work of some of the people on this panel. Um, I was just reading yesterday uh, Francis's uh, introduction to Bishop Geoffrey Robinson's last book and uh, the tribute that he made to Jeff for the tireless work that he did over decades. And I think, you know, there are now others who get the message, even in the church hierarchy. And um, so I think there are, I think there are positive signs, yeah. Uh, Mark Metherall, I'm going to throw to you as the moderator. We've got a lot of questions coming in and, and we welcome those. I'm going to take one as a comment, Tony Jones style, and that's from Margaret Atchison, who says, what does God do desire for the church? Would it be a Latin mass? <laughs> um, <laughs> Mark, give us a sense of what's coming in on the Q&A. And I think quite a lot of the comments and questions have gone to people's rather a critical uh, view of the church's real life performance uh, not just in the past, but now, uh, Georgina um, uh, comments that uh, what's happening, what is the church doing in terms of First Nation people um, when they remain among the most, uh, were had a much higher rate of uh, suffering sexual abuse than the population at large. Georgina asks what priority are we giving to the restoration of justice and truth-telling? Uh, we have uh, another person makes, uh, Roger Fitzgerald makes the interesting point, what symbolism uh, was there at the ceremony today or yesterday with the bishops gathering around uh, the mother uh, Mary of the Cross, MacKillop? thinking of bishops grouping besides the tomb and the story of her excommunication and humility by bishops of the day. Um, Beth Doherty has said she is mortified to read admittedly on social media today that some people think have argued that the smoking ceremony and welcome to a country are a return to pagan rituals which she says goes uh, many on these pages are sadly very much in favor of the clericalism and trappings of pre-Vatican Catholicism. Uh, so I think quite a few of the questions are looking at, you know, the reality of today and how it might uh, fit in with the, with the great words that we're hearing. Uh, Karen Fox 
says the exclusion of women uh, from senior roles in the Catholic Church uh, clashes somewhat with the Pope who's uh, introducing dicasteries where women can hold senior positions. She asks, why aren't we seeing this in Australia? So I think all in all, uh, quite a few of the comments and questions do have, a, I must say, a rather critical stance uh, on what's needed in the church right now. Well, Mark, I don't know whether you saw me rolling my eyes at the comment about smoking ceremonies. People might have heard it. I rolled them so quickly. Uh, but look, I'll go to some of those questions now with our panellists. Mary Collo makes the comment that it's difficult to know what God wants apart from genuine discernment, which does involve indeed hearing views from around the group. Um, but Rosie Joyce, to you on that question, if Pope Francis can introduce the dicasteries with women potentially in leadership positions, how does that fit with the exclusion of women in the Australian church? Well, to start off with, it's not happening in Australia. Yes. <laughs> um, it, it's a step, and he has done that, and it's a rightful step. Um, but on the home base, um, if you're in a diocese or archdiocese where nothing is happening, Pope Francis seems a long way away. Um, and I think it's the independence of the diocese and bishops which can hinder that development. Um, even, for example, the diocesan bishops that are reluctant to have diocesan pastoral councils because they have plenty of people they can talk to. Um, I think I think what Pope Francis is doing is a start. But mind you, he could do more. He could say tomorrow that women can be deacons because, after all, that is only a church law, a man-made law. But he is taking small steps. But uh, I would like the Australian church to take some small steps too. Mm -hmm. um, Francis, I'm going to go to you on a question from Peter Schneider, who says that a key driver for the Plenary Council was religious child sexual abuse. He says the Catholic Church's response to the abuse, their families and whistleblowers has been the same the world over, resisting responsibility for healing victims' spiritual and psychological well-being opting for legalistic processes and meagre payouts. And <clears throat> have we seen, I'm sorry, the screen keeps scrolling along on me, which is always the classic of these situations, isn't it? When you're mid, mid question. Have we seen the human face showing in the obligation to nurture faith, to protect the innocent, to understand their hurt and shame and to show compassion along with a sense of obligation from the institutional church? Look, I, there, there's obviously been a, a, it was great that Frank talked about Jeff Robinson because that was a sea change of mentality of moving away from a legalistic approach to a more pastoral approach. And the main criticism post that was that, well, that approach was not uniformly applied across the church or consistently applied or the people applying it having the skills to do so. But so what it really tells us that that is that the instinct of the church should be to react from its heart, not its head. We shouldn't be about risk management. We should be about an embrace of the of people that we have abused, no conditions. That's the attitude we're looking for. And yes, there are measures that have been put in place that are to reflect that attitude. What we need though is a lot stronger scrutiny on ourselves. We really do need an independent audit of what we do regularly. We shouldn't be trying to handle things internally. The days of the church investigating itself were meant to be over. We still do it. We can't apply things universe, uh, na nationally and, and, compl and compliance doesn't apply. There are many measures still that don't demonstrate best practice. But ultimately, the paradigm shift must always be that a pastoral response has to drive all of our thinking not a risk management response that was the past. Frank Brennan, I want to go to you with another question from Mick May, who says the fundamental cultural issue is church's teaching on sexual morality, of which there's been no mention in any church response to the Royal Commission. The priest bishop is but the policeman of that teaching. Child abuse, rejection of divorced and remarried, LGBTQI members as well as celibacy are all based on that warped sexual morality. Nick says this is fundamental institutional resistance to the findings of the Royal Commission. What's your response? 
Uh, I think the more we have lay people who are becoming professors of moral theology, the better. And we're seeing a lot of that in the United States now. I think it's starting to occur here. I mean, if I could maybe just segue back into the Indigenous issues that we started the session with, uh, but which hasn't had much of a run. I mean, if you look at what happened there today, you had two quite positive statements from bishops from the Northern Territory and from Wilcania Forbes, but then fantastic interventions by two of the Indigenous leaders themselves, Erica Bernard and Mary O'Leary, spoke very passionately with their life experience. They were overwhelmingly endorsed by the whole community that was gathered there. And it's about being attentive to those voices. I mean, one of the critical amendments that was moved today was that rather than saying the Plenary Council commits to work towards recognition, reconciliation and justice, that the Plenary Council commits to walk with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in continuing that task. And so if there were the commitment to be walking with the victims of abuse, if there were the commitment to be listening more attentively to the passionate voices of experience, then we'd be on the right path. And so coming back to your point, yes, having people expert in moral theology who know what a full sexual life is about would be a very helpful thing. And it's time we got with that program. Look, a comment from Gerald on that. A constant question is why priests and bishops can be so positive in personal dialogues, but so resistant in their institutional responses. Uh, John McKay, I, I just wanted to go to you with a question around the reconciliation issue. And we're slightly pushing time out, but we did begin a few minutes late. Um, John Georgina says, truth telling and treaty were equally important as voice in the 2017 statement from the heart, and they need to be paid equal attention to voice. Georgina says, I'm just back from visiting remote communities in the NT, communities profoundly decimated, disempowered, their local voice disrespected under 15 years of federally imposed NT intervention. Communities want an end to overt racism and a right to self-determination and treaty now. Will the church commit to truth-telling and treaty? John, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, I think so. And, and look, for me, from my point of view and my experience, growing up in Central Australia um, um, and, and for my own family, my mum grew up in four missions in, in South Australia and the public schools that my grandmother had 15 children. It was the Catholic church that educated um, my mum. She wouldn't have got an education if it wasn't for Catholic schools. I've had nothing but good experiences with the Catholic church. And my best friends is a Catholic priest. Um, so, you know, yes, there's negative stuff. I work on the front line in the Aboriginal community. There's people out there who are abusing, bashing wives, um, and they're, they're walking around town like heroes. And I'm involved in the Catholic Archdiocese in Adelaide, and we have meetings weekly about how we're going to improve our church, how we're going to do a lot of things. I agree justice, yes, and truth-telling. Um, we are moving forward. There's a long way to go. Um, but I, I, I feel confident that um, from our meeting today and the support that we got as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, that people are getting on side. And, and there's improvement in the community where um, when I grew up, the worst thing to be was Aboriginal. But I find today people are wanting to learn about Aboriginal culture. Um, and I'm a bit fed up with uh, people, all people, picking on all the churches. There's a war happening. The, the worst thing that happens in war is women and children are affected. There's women being murdered every day. Um, there's children being abused. Um, it's not just the church. I think the government, the, the whole community have to get behind this. And look, I, I, I might just pose as a comment, um, a question from Ray Johnston, who says, when will the church be more explicit in welcoming those who comprise modern young Australians, he says, the divorced, single parents, LGBTIQ+, recently arrived migrants and First Nation peoples. But the thing I like about what Ray has to say is, it is one thing to not exclude, it is another to actively include and to indeed embrace, which is a, a terrific spin to put on what we've discussed today. And I'm pleased to hear from our guests today on the tracker that there is actually quite a sense of recognition 
and some optimism about some very profound issues that were grappled with today um, at, the, um, at, at today's assembly. Um, thank you all for being with us this evening. You can also follow the Council's progress via several blogs, including from tonight's guest. Francis Sullivan is writing a blog via Catholic Social Services. John Warhurst's blog can be found with Concerned Catholics Canberra Goulburn. Geraldine Doog is also following and noting this process. The Council Agenda's Motions and Amendments document was released last week on the Australian Catholic Bishops' site. Tomorrow night, we'll be joined by Claire Victory, who is the National President of St Vincent de Paul, and Father Andrew Hamilton. We'll be discussing Missionary Call, and we'll go on to Ian Cameron, Tracy McEwen, and Ben O for an important discussion on inclusion. Look, I'd like to thank everyone who's been with us tonight very much indeed. Thank you for your time and please join us again tomorrow night for the third edition of the Plenary Tracker. I'm Genevieve Jacobs.